It's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to our two Rose Fellowship lecturers, Jesse Olson and Ben Gates. Jesse Olson is a project manager for the Farm Worker Housing Development Corporation. She is a 2007 graduate of the UO Architecture Department, was a recipient of the Brown Research Grant for Study in Japan, and was, of course, an Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellow. Jesse has assembled her academic and professional experiences from across the fields of sustainable design and development. With her continued work with FHDC, she is helping to build the capacity and increase the portfolio in the, excuse me, of an important CDC dedicated to improving the lives of farm workers and families in Oregon. Ben Gates is a project manager and architect at Central City Concern, a nonprofit agency serving single adults and families in Portland, Oregon, who are impacted by homelessness, poverty, and addiction. As an Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellow, Ben improved affordability and amenities for families in downtown Portland. Ben's passion to improve livability and advance green building is exemplified in his published initiative, Achieving Water Independence in Buildings, which led to statewide regulatory change to reuse water in buildings. As a developer, Ben has completed or is working on over $10 million of projects that serve the community and low-income individuals. Please join me in welcoming Jesse Olson and Ben Gates. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, we're excited to be here today. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. It is on. Um, to share some of our experiences um, uh, working in the field of affordable housing and development and architecture, um, being recent graduates of the University of Oregon, I graduated in 2001 and Jesse graduated in 2007. Um, while I waited five years to um, apply for the fellowship. Jesse jumped right in um, and uh, joined Farmworker Housing Development Corporation um, to work on some important um, affordable housing projects. So um, I think each of us um, would like to talk a little bit about our experiences uh, in design and architecture and also transitioning into um, what we like to call uh, uh, development, making good projects happen. And I think we've both been involved in um, areas of making projects happen that's a little bit different than um, the traditional archi architecture practice. And I think something that you all might find interesting, um, perhaps some are near graduation, um, looking for jobs out there. Um, some of the things that we've done um, might prompt you to think about uh, other ways to make good design happen. Um, what we'll do is we'll uh, each talk for up to half an hour about our uh, uh, background, how we got into development of affordable housing, and some of the things that we've done. But what we'd like to pay particular attention to is just some of the barriers we've come up uh, against and some of the frustrations. I think you know um, we've both found that the uh, fellowship has presented us with some unique challenges, some which just seem overwhelming at the time, but I think both feel that um, only through that challenge have we been able to um, achieve better projects. So let's see if the slides work here. Let me try a couple buttons here. Oh yeah, that works. And I think I can go back and forth with a wow. wheel. All right. OK. Um, so how to make good stuff happen. Um, working in the development field exposes you to um, a number of different, uh, I guess, <coughs> ultimately wearing a lot of different hats, um, as there's so many things that come together to make um, good architecture happen. So what we've found, we were kind of brainstorming about you know, some of the things that have led to the projects um, that we worked on um, to happen. Um, and you know, it's everything from establishing a vision for the project, uh, researching and responding to the particular market that you're serving, uh, working in nonprofit organizations, going deeper and um, researching and responding to community needs, not just market needs, uh, forging stakeholder partnerships, uh, definitely earning community support and overcoming barriers where they exist, um, procuring funding, managing a budget, 
So uh, the ability to identify a need, find funding for it, and then make sure that project happens for um, the given funding that you can find or leverage that funding to find um, other sources of funding um, if uh, you're lacking money to carry something out. Of course, design and managing construction um, and ensuring the occupancy um, of the building for its intended use. So I'm going to pass the mic to Jessie um, to talk about her experiences. And, okay, I just want to go back to this for a second because when we were putting together these things, um, how to make good stuff happen, one thing that Ben and I were talking about is the kind of things that you are trained in as an architect, whether in school or in a kind of a more traditional practice. And there's several things on there that we hit on. I mean, obviously, design, managing construction, occupancy or programming, um, establishing a vision for a project. These are all things that skills as an architect, or that you have as skills as an architect. And a lot of these things um, we kind of learned on the job throughout the fellowship and once you dive into the field of community development, you're necessarily managing budgets, working on funding, and really pulling together community support. So I think it's really complementary and something that we talk a lot about is you know, as your skills as an architect are really transferable to a lot of different positions. You know, there's kind of a narrow traditional view of an architect, but I think it's good to encourage you to look at like how your skills of managing a project, talking to people, um, just pulling together a vision can really work in a lot of different situations. So yeah, I've, I started with the Farmworker Housing Development Corporation. We just call it FHDC. Um, that's what I will be referring to. Um, in 2007, and that fellowship was three years, so all the fellowships last three years, and you're in the community working on the ground with the people that live there. Um, and both of us, Ben and I, have stayed on at our host organizations past the end of our fellowship, which I think is a testament to the fact that if you come in there with skills as an architect, you show them what you can do, um, they'll figure out a way to, to keep you on. Um, and we both sort of had that experience. So one thing that I wanted to mention is when I started, like how I kind of got interested in the field of development, um, one sort of momentous thing for me was uh, the last couple years of my school, I was doing a bunch of research on farm worker housing as part of my thesis project. And I had gotten in touch with a large pear orchard grower down in southern Oregon, and I was working on a design for them for farm worker housing. They needed it really badly. They had terrible housing conditions down there. Um, and I really spent a year fleshing out what I thought was a great design. I worked with a lot of stakeholders down there. We went so far as to have a bid. And then the project dropped off the face of the planet. I mean, it was almost like they wouldn't return my phone calls. I presented to the VP of this big grower. They wanted to do it, and then it went away. And for me as a designer, that was really frustrating because I had put my heart and energy into a project. But when it was sort of swept, swept off the table, no one needed to explain to me why. You know, I didn't understand, was it because of political reasons in the community? Was it because of zoning? Something changed? Was it just there just wasn't funding? And to me, that was a big like wake-up call. Like, I want to be behind the scenes. I want to understand how to make projects happen uh, and to even get them to the point where you can have a design. And then once you have a design, get it to the point where you can follow it through and people can move in. And as an architect, you're often limited to kind of just a smaller phase of the life of a project from beginning to end. So I thought it was, it was really valuable to me to learn that lesson of um, wanting to kind of know how to really make it happen and, and follow through. Oh, you do it. So I'm going to talk a little bit, just like real quick, on the background of the need for farm worker housing in Oregon just to kind of give the impression of why I think this work is really important, why it's necessary, and then give some examples of projects that I've worked on so we can see how that translates into actually working in the field. So FHGC's mission is recognizing the vital contribution of farm workers to our economy. The mission of FHGC is to develop farm worker leadership for stronger and more secure families and communities through affordable housing, social services, education, and economic development. And these are examples of of projects that we have that don't look like the traditional kind of labor farm worker camps that often come to mind when we're thinking of farm worker housing. And that's really important part of FHGC's model is we want to create housing that really fits in the communities that it's in. We develop housing for families, not on farm housing. Um, 
and that's a big part of our mission. We also integrate uh, leadership roles for our residents. They're involved in, we have resident association presidents on our board of directors as a nonprofit. So we really get a lot of feedback from our residents in terms of what's working on the properties and what's not. Um, and that was really important for me in uh, getting to know the community that I was working with, kind of coming in as a bit of an outsider, but being able to have really direct feedback to the end users and the people living in our communities. So another important part is the history. These photos are from the late 1980s, um, taken just right outside Marion County. <coughs> These photos were taken right before FHDC formed in the early 1990s as a nonprofit. And so you can see there was a huge need. I mean, at this point, this was the housing conditions for most of the farm labor in Oregon. Um, at that point, it was primarily immigrant labor. That's changed a little bit, um, but this is what we saw. <coughs> These are photos that I've taken myself of housing conditions that still exist in Oregon for farm workers. So this is what's happening today. Um, this is out in Washington County. And I think what's worth mentioning is that the industry of farm labor in this state, which is one of our biggest industries, has really changed. It's not, we don't rely so heavily on immigrant labor. What that means is that a lot of the farm workers bring their families to live with them permanently throughout the year, and they'll cobble together jobs um, that last throughout the year, so they stay. And the, the problem with that is the housing model that we've set up as the typology for farm worker housing d is not, it, it's not safe for men, which w it was set up, it was designed for, but it's especially not safe for kids like this. There is oftentimes just, r it's ravaged with mold. You have several families living in one unit. There's not always plumbing inside. It's, it's, it's deplorable, and it's right outside of a lot of our cities, and it supports a huge industry of, the of Oregon and the United States. Um, so it's not, it's the issues are kind of more systematic. It's not just housing, and I just mentioned this because it's important, I think, to remember, you know, as designers and as developers, that it's not just the things that we're building, but there's this whole kind of system that surrounds it that it's helpful to understand at a core level because then you can kind of translate back to how people live. Um, these are just some stats. You know, most of our residents don't have access to health insurance. Most of them are overweight or, over or obese because they can't afford healthy food, which is really ironic considering that they're picking the food that we eat. 14% um, of them go hungry in, in the past year and 40% and growing um, are living in food insecure households. So the model that FHCC uses, it works because we create housing that stabilizes families. And once a family is stabilized, they can then focus on other things like sending their kids to school. Um, if you look at the rate of high school graduation, graduation rates for migrant farm worker youths across the nation, it's about 50%. Sometimes it dips below that in certain states. And we have about a 98% high school graduation rate for the kids who live at our communities. So that's just one example of, of what you can do with a safe, healthy home for a family and what they can then do to provide for their family and improve their living conditions. So FHGC's development goals, this was sort of set up for me when I started my job there. Um, increase housing development pace, so basically let's build more units, we know we need them. Expand beyond housing, can we look at community centers, childcare facilities, or other amenities that we know the community needs. Increase the level of green development and best practices that we use in our housing development. Expand public policy efforts to work on the kind of larger agenda of farm worker housing issues in the state and then foster collaborations with different partners to make all of, the, all of these things happen. And this goes back to my first point about our skills as architects being really transferable into the field of development because um, when we're looking at these different goals, these are, th these are things that we know how to do, you know? Like, we know how to bring people together. We know how to have that vision. Uh, we know, obviously, a lot about green development and best practices and different housing and building typologies and what communities might need. So I think that that's a, an important point that I want people to take away with is, you know, once you're learning about programming and community involvement and building design in general, you can really help support the goals of nonprofits such as these. You gotta do it, sorry. Um, this is just a little snapshot of my work plan 
that was set up uh, when I started the fellowship. And then on the bottom are kind of the additional projects that we picked up along the way that actually were projects that I was able to bring to the table for my organization. Um, and you know that's important too because it's about building capacity and being the kind of person who can get out there and bring projects to the table. Um, and so you can see there's, you know, we're a really small office, so we're only working on two or three projects at a time. But each year you kind of stagger through and, and projects get delayed, of course. Um, but you're able to work on different phases of them at different times, which I thought was, was really helpful for my uh, professional growth. So I'm just going to give a little bit of info about the different projects, just so you can kind of get a sense of the type of work that I've been doing. This was Nuevo Monastero phase one and two. Um, this is 90 units. This was the first project that FHGC built um, when, they, when they were formed in the early 90s. It was built in two phases in 1994 and 1998 in Woodburn. Uh, this project overcame historic uh, prejudice and racism in the city of Woodburn. The mayor actually at the time refused. The, the city owned the property and uh, someone had started to build housing there and then had gone bankrupt. So it was like there were a couple little buildings that were started, but it was zoned for multifamily housing. The city refused to give it to FHCC. They didn't want to build housing for Latino farm workers. And the then governor, Barbara Ra Walters, who was a supporter of our labor organizing union, who's uh, the umbrella organization to FHCC. So FHCC lobbied Barbara, uh, Barbara Roberts, and she ended up withholding the city's economic <coughs> development funds for two years until they gave FHCC this property. And the city ended up actually giving the property to the county, Marion County, so that Marion County gave it to FHCC, all so that they would never have to say that they gave property to build Latino farm worker housing. So of course, this was way before my time. This is part of the history, part of the story of FHCC's formation. But what's been really great for me is I work with the city of Woodburn a ton, getting new developments going, and they love us. They, they tour our properties all the time. They use us an, as an example of safe housing, healthy housing, well-designed green housing in Woodburn. So it really goes to show you know, what you can overcome in a period of, that's just 20 years, um, and changing the way people think about the world through buildings and through design. Um, this, but the problem, so that's the, the glory of the story. <laughs> the problem is the housing wasn't built well at the time. Um, in the 90s, we, we weren't building houses. We didn't know about the building science that we know about and that we learn about now, especially in the Northwest climate with the amount of moisture that we get. So these buildings were really falling apart. You could poke your, uh, your finger through the siding. There was mold and dry rot everywhere. It was a mess. So we had to do a major rehab, and that was the first project that I worked on when I came on as a Rose Fellow. So these are a couple of before and after shots. We were able to add. We had a ton of drainage issue. Um, it's, it's probably kind of similar around here, but we have really clay soil there, so the water doesn't have anywhere to go, and the original designers didn't really take that into account. So we added a bunch of drainage. You can see a bioswale there. And we really brightened up a lot of these courtyards. We ended up doing a full um, tear off of the building envelope, new roof, windows, doors, able to upgrade all the energy efficiency items. And for me, it was a great learning experience. I had never worked on a rehab before, and um, it's really fun to work on those kind of projects where you tear open the walls, you have no idea the kind of conditions you're going to find. You know, of course, it ended up taking a year and a half longer than it should have, and the economy crashed right before we were selling our tax credits for this project. But we made it happen, and in the end, um, it's going to last for a lot, a lot longer now. And the families that are living there um, have reported lower, actually, no, so far, no cases of um, asthma attacks. Whereas before, we had a lot of respiratory issues. It's common in farm worker families because of the ex exposure to pesticides that is brought into the home. But with the amount of ventilation that we added, um, we've, that has been reduced to a large extent. And so we were able to partner with Enterprise um, with their Green Communities Program. And they had a third party assessment that they assessed projects all over the nation and looked at their energy efficiency upgrades and ventilation strategies. And they were really impressed with how healthy the community looked. So that's something I'm really proud of. Um, this is a very boring slide, but <laughs> when we, you know, in development, it's a lot of it is about the dollars. So I just wanted to show an example of what um, our sources of funding looked like for this project. So each of these funding sources comes with its own set of requirements. And that's one of the biggest challenges of working in nonprofit housing development is juggling all the sources and, and knowing 
which ones dictate what. So certain, um, certain funding sources might dictate that 50% of the units serve residents who make 50% of the median family income or less. Some funding sources may stipulate that it's just farm workers that live here. Some stipulate certain energy efficiency requirements. So a lot of the job that um, Ben and I do when we're juggling these projects is making sure that we connect the dots. So we're, we're balancing the budget, making sure we have the money there, but then cross-referencing that with our architects and with our team to make sure that we're meeting all those requirements so that for the next 30 years or the life of the project financially, that, um, that we're getting the job done. And it's, just to point out, it's really expensive, <laughs> unfortunately, um, to do this. These projects were built for under $100,000 a unit in the 90s, and now we're rehabbing them at $200,000 a unit 15 to 18 years later. You know, not a sustainable model, um, but one that the industry, because of examples like this, is really working to change. And one thing that my role has been um, on a statewide and a na nationwide basis is to talk about rehabs and the need for them, what to look for, how to do it better the first time, how we can save money, because uh, you know, as state funding agencies and public housing agencies, we don't want to be reinvesting $15 million 15 years later into these projects. So a lot of it kind of goes back to that housing policy stuff that was on that first slide of goals and bringing attention to, to these challenges. Technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> I can flip through if we're stuck. Yeah. Oh, each time. Did we skip one? Yeah, I'll flip through. I think we skipped one. <coughs> we go back one more. So Nuevo Monastery Phase Four. Um, the the site plan there you see for phase one and two, that's the project that I just talked about, the 90 units that we rehabbed. We own a, a parcel of land that's about three acres, just kitty corner to that, um, which is basically the fourth phase of this community um, that unfortunately I've been trying to, this is the third year that I've been trying to finance it. We have an excellent design, um, a lot of city support, a lot of neighborhood support. I organized several charrettes, um, not, with, not only with the residents that live here, but with the neighbors, and it's ready to go. Um, so that's one of the the frustrations and the challenges of working in the, in the development world is you kind of have to watch as things slow down. But uh, we just submitted our funding application for this and we're hoping that it moves forward this year. So we're excited to build 40 new units on this site. Um, this is another rehab project that I just completed this spring. Um, this is a 48 unit project in Salem called Colonial Libertad. Um, this was a great experience for me personally and professionally because I was able to take what I learned during the Nuevo Amanecer rehab um, and just fully project manage this project um, on my own. And we saw this project is only, it was built in 2007 or 2006, it was only five years old. And we were seeing some of the same, unfortunately some of the same construction defects issues that we saw at Nuevo Monacer. Um, but we knew enough ahead of time now that to, you know, once you start seeing mold or water intrusion issues uh, from a building science standpoint, there we now know kind of a more preventative approach so we're able to do a much smaller scope of a rehab that will hopefully prevent the kind of damage that we saw at Nuevo Monacer. And then this slide and the next slide are two new projects, new acquisition rehab projects that we're working on. Um, the state right now has a, an agenda called housing preservation. If you're interested in housing, uh, affordable housing policy at all, you'll hear this word a lot, preservation. And it, it is a physical preservation of buildings. But it's also a timing thing. Um, the state, starting in the 80s, so we introduced in the early 90s, really, we introduced the um, low-income housing tax credit as a federal funding source for um, for for d uh, developing affordable housing. And depending on how these projects were set up, they either had a 20, 30, or 40-year life. Um, so now we're coming up on the end of several projects in that span um, that were financed this way that are now sort of at risk of leaving the affordable housing pool and turning in essentially into market rate housing. So the state has an agenda to sort of preserve these housing units, fix them up, keep them in the affordable portfolio so that they don't lose, I think there's like a third of the state's housing portfolio which could be at risk for this. Um, so that's another important uh, po policy conversation and finding where these projects are located in our service areas and then 
try to figure out how to develop them. So there's two 24 unit projects, one's uh, affordable senior housing, one's affordable family housing that I'm currently working on the acquisition of. We can go on to the last one. This is another fun project that I'm proud to be a part of. Um, I mentioned the Farm Worker Union. This is called Pecun. Uh, they actually were the, um, like I said, the umbrella organization to FHCC. They've done a lot of important work in Oregon in terms of immigrant rights and farm worker labor rights. And they have a group called Capaces, which is a group of six or seven organizations that serve the farm worker population in Oregon. And they want to build this leadership institute uh, to train young leaders in that movement um, to kind of keep knowledge going, um, help people advance in their careers, and kind of bring advocacy to the group. So uh, I'm working with a team from that, from the Capacities Leadership Institute, and we're trying to achieve passive house designation um, on this building. It, it could be the first passive house office building, uh, but we're still over a year out on construction to finish that, so we'll see. But that's been a really fun process. They're building it primarily through volunteer labor, uh, a lot of donated materials, and so that's been fun to work with the design team on kind of bringing together those moving puzzle pieces on that type of volunteer project. I think this is just about it. Yeah, so I just wanted to end on this slide um, just to kind of sum it up because one thing that's really important to me in this type of work is that you're working with people. You're, you know, it's, it's more than like a drawing on your computer screen. It's not at all abstract because you see how people live and use the houses that you work on. And I think that's one of the most rewarding things about the job um, because you know, when you see the faces of people, when you understand the type of housing conditions that they would have otherwise, and then you see them in healthy homes that you've helped to create, you know, that means, I think, t to me, that means 10 times more than creating the most beautiful you know, building that we can from an architectural standpoint. Um, so I like to show these images just because it, it really is about the people who live there. And I think Ben will probably have similar things to say. So. Thanks, Jesse. So um, why don't we open it up to questions for Jesse and take a couple questions um, before I launch in. And one thing we forgot to mention, too, is we'll be introducing the 2011 Rose Architectural Fellowship uh, opportunities for this year, of which there is five. Um, so at the end of our talk, um, we'll spend some time uh, just introducing each of those, and there'll be a chance to ask questions about each of those opportunities and the application process. So any questions out there? Um, yes, this is probably more of a question about the, the affordable housing system with, with the families here. I'm wondering as you're, as you're sort of rehabbing these units and getting input from the families, if they have any financial buy-in alongside of their personal buy-in of living there, or how that all works with the financing that you have for your organization? Because this is rental housing, they don't have financial buy-in essentially um, because they won't own the houses but uh, we are we do include them a lot in the decision making in terms of what they need for their families and when we're rehabbing projects we also find if if we have to move them out <coughs> for instance we help find them a place to live in the meantime and then move them back in but there um, I should have shown a slide with the income because the income level the incomes on these families is really low way below the poverty level. I mean, we have, uh, at Nuevo Monastero, I think the average household income is $16,000 a year. Uh, so there isn't a lot of room for, for financial buy-in from the, from the tenants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the construction question. For the bad 90s construction, is that like single wall construction? Yes. Bad yeah. flashing and things like that? No flashing. No flashing. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to say no sealant, but I'm not going to say sealant. <laughs> yeah. And even the project that was built in 2005 um, did not have a rain screen, um, did not have window head flashing, uh, a, lot, a host of issues, things that we assume are just being put there. Um, that's part of the, the problem with these projects is because they're so slow on the uptake, and then you get going, and they move. And it's like you have a nine-month window of time or you know, whatever is set up with your, what you can afford in a construction loan, you have a really limited budget, and you oftentimes, until recently, you have teams that don't have a ton of construction oversight experience, so there isn't someone looking for that. And I think that's one valuable thing that Ben and I have brought to the table, and the industry has really responded to this as a whole. It's not just us, 
but making sure that these architectural details matter. You know, in, when we're talking about sustainability, I'm, I'm not talking about solar panels. I want, does the building leak? Will it stay standing up for the next 30 years? You know, that's the kind of sustainability that we're talking about, so. What was the second photo of your second um, renovation that you did of the attic area? What was that? Oh, so that was mold. Uh, the and the photo. second one was yeah. after the white. Yeah. That was remediated. So we had to go in there. Um, again, this was five years old. This was because there was no ventilation um, in the attic. These are, you know, I'm now a, like a mold technical nerd about these things because I, I have learned a, a ton about this, but I think it's really important to talk about as architects. Um, when you remediate, then you, you paint everything white at the end. So that was what that was. Um, you, depending on the extent and the type of mold, um, you can clean it with certain products. They go in there in the moon suits. No one can be living there. They have, they have to flush out the air. Um, and then they, they do like growth checks and they check for moisture. And then once it's like signed off by the industrial hygienist expert, they'll, they'll paint everything with uh, mold resistant paint. And we added ventilation. One other one, quick. Um, wondering, as an architect coming into this this er area where architects normally aren't present, um, how receptive was the was the uh, organization to, to you coming in, and how much support did you get from the Rose Fellowship? Um, a lot on both of those. I think that's the advantage of u using the fellowship as a kind of a tool. I, I think you could really make the case to uh, community development or corporations or other nonprofits that they could use design help in this way but because of the fellowship that support was there it, it's challenging I mean I think a lot of us face the same thing at the beginning like are we the architect on the project well no we're not exactly the architect are we the the developer well but I want to know about the design you know so you kind of flip back and forth and that part can be challenging because it, it is different roles even though there's a lot of overlap but the fellowship supports it because you have a lot of people who are in the same boat as you, um, so you're able to kind of help each other figure that out. And, you know, in fact, the organizations apply to get a Rose Fellow, so they also have to prove that they are receptive and that they want a designer and that they have these green goals or the goals that are outlined in the, in the fellowship application. So you're, you're, you're put in a good situation where the work is needed. Thanks, Jesse. OK, so again, going back to how to make good uh, stuff happen, um, as Jesse mentioned, there's a lot of hats that one wears um, doing this kind of work. So um, Nate, you had asked a question about um, kind of the support there. And um, Jesse, your response reminds me that like I was confronted with a huge identity crisis when I came into working on development work because I had been uh, practicing architecture for five years. I'm a licensed architect. Um, I graduated from University of Oregon in 2001. I immediately started working for Sarah Architects in Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, I think my interest changed a lot in school, and I started um, wanting to become an architect um, when I was really young. I drew castles for fun and figured out how to make better fortifications, and I was really interested in old buildings. Um, but then, you know, in school, I really um, learned about uh, community uh, focused development, green building, and it drew me to be involved with uh, student groups like the um, Solar Information Center, which started to shape my interests as well as um, uh, taking classes from many of the professors here. Um, I, I, uh, making me interested in things like vernacular building, um, good housing design, um, passive buildings. Um, and so as I pursued that work with the Solar Center, um, I got involved with things like the HOPES Conference. Um, and towards the end of my um, time here, I actually uh, co-founded the Ecological Design Center and uh, I wrote an application to the um, student body for a um, $100,000 grant to put um, uh, solar panels on our buildings. And so um, I got this funding for <coughs> the solar panels here, but then I took off and other students did the hard work and made it happen. Um, so I had some really um, 
uh, early kind of um, reinforcements of, of uh, a pursuit of, of my kind of interest in, in making really good buildings happen. But fundamentally, I'm interested in just having maximum impact on the built environment. And I think that was really fostered here at the University of Oregon. It led me to um, go back to my native Portland um, as I'm really er interested in the urban environment. And there worked at Sarah Architects, um, a now uh, recognized uh, firm uh, leading in sustainability uh, projects. And my first project was the rehab of the uh, Pioneer Courthouse in downtown Portland, including the preservation of it and seismic upgrades. We picked up the whole building and put it on giant base isolators so that the building would stay still as the earth moved around it. So that was a technical challenge. Um, and then you might recognize this building. This is my last project at uh, Sarah Architects. Our first building information modeled building, um, uh, the Tate condominiums down on 13th and Olive. And so um, working in a firm, I found it was great experience to, excuse me, your time's up, Jesse. <laughs> um, it was great experience to um, uh, understand the field of architecture, but um, I felt something was missing. So, you know, the university is thinking back to that time, there was the ability to kind of make some good stuff happen. Here it was projects handed to me. Um, and I felt like I wasn't involved in a formative role on the projects um, uh, uh, to the extent that I could be. So uh, that led to, um, oh, and by the way, so um, here is, I feel really lucky too, and I think this is what I'm wanting to help others achieve, um, you know, uh, good urban livability. So my home's in downtown Portland and I get to walk to work every day. So my work is in the Biltmore Hotel, now at Central City Concern, um, and Sarah Architects is actually just right around the corner. So I felt like what I was missing is um, this ability to really have more impact in the built in environment. And um, at that point, there was an opportunity to apply for a Rose Fellowship opportunity in Portland, um, which I was awarded. Needs to be close. There we go. And um, began working with Central City Concern, and um, I feel so lucky. It's a it's a really fantastic organization. We um, basically are working in uh, these kind of four main areas, addressing homelessness, and with the recognition that homelessness is caused by so many different issues. It's caused by um, poverty um, and unemployment. It's sometimes, and many times, mental illnesses, addictions, um, criminality, and so we seek to wrap services around people according to their unique needs, uh, which often includes affordable housing, people coming just off the streets, but um, also often uh, drug and alcohol treatment services. And then as they get stabilized and their lives back together, um, that's also paired with um, employment services. And so we serve about 15,000 um, low-income and homeless people annually. And we do that through all of those services. And some people know us as a health organization because we have like 400 people who work for us, uh, many of them in the um, uh, primary and behavioral health care side. Uh, but I work in a team of, of four on our development staff where we're uh, maintaining and building new buildings, buildings like these here. We have 25 buildings in our portfolio, about 1,500 units of housing serving people at the lowest income spectrum, people with no and very low incomes. Um, these are supportive housing buildings, and so they're buildings um, in some cases that are either drug and alcohol free or that have uh, real special resident services on site to help people um, with issues they might be facing. And so it's different from your normal apartment building that you'll rent. It's actually um, providing additional supports to help people be successful in their tenancy. My main project, and Jesse showed you a kind of a diverse work plan. My work plan started out as one building, an urban family project um, to support uh, 
families living in our downtown environment and provide affordable housing. And um, when I started, the project was just kind of a glimmer in our um, organization's eye. And um, it's something that we wanted to do, um, thought we could do in Portland's uh, River District Urban Renewal Area, because there was funds there to support affordable housing. And um, so when I began, I was tasked to work on this project. Well, where do I start? Um, I began by talking to families in the neighborhood, trying to understand um, needs. There wasn't many, so uh, what I found is I had to go beyond the neighborhood, and um, I facilitated what I think was a pretty successful family forum, um, which brought together families who might want to live in the Pearl District and those who already did, um, the limited families who did, and just talked about uh, what was in the uh, neighborhood that they used and liked and what was missing. And this was kind of my first barrier to community development and affordable housing, where in order to plan for this family forum, I got together a number of um, uh, stakeholders in the neighborhood around the table, neighborhood associations and uh, community organizations. And I s said, oh, this would be a great idea. Let's try to make this happen. So they're like, okay, let's make this happen. Um, but everybody has their normal jobs and nobody was really pushing it forward and I was waiting for the expert, the real entrenched community person to pull this forward and um, realize that I was that person. Um, I was passionate. Um, I, could, I could push this forward. I had the time um, and the capacity. And so over the course of several months of planning, we were able to bring in a number of organizations representing schools and affordable housing um, to this forum understand needs and then show the neighborhood uh, and our partners kind of what was missing and what we realized that it was more than uh, like two and three bedroom apartments for families that was missing in the neighborhood it was also some key amenities community center school and child care um, everything else was there good jobs um, grocery shopping all that kind of other stuff and a great environment for kids and so um, uh, that was interesting, and so we said, okay, well, where's a neighborhood that is similar to Portland that maybe has some of this going on? Well, there was nothing really on the West Coast that we could point to except going past the border to Canada, and we um, found that in Vancouver, in their False Creek neighborhood, they had a neighborhood very similar to the Pearl, Yale Town, that actually had built affordable family housing, a school, and childcare first in the formation of this new neighborhood that they were investing in. And it, in fact, drew more families and drew um, uh, doctors and other kinds of um, opportunities for families. So to show that it would be possible, we actually um, brought several partners, um, a local uh, community center organization looking for space that was uh, just in a small commercial space but wanted to grow in the Pearl District. Um, uh, representatives of schools in the neighborhood association, as well as uh, city commissioner at the time, Sam Adams, right there. And so we, you know, began reaching out to partners, you know, who would be interested in this, who could help make this building happen. And uh, we brought on board uh, uh, a team to uh, look at meeting these needs. And so, you know, my, my early work really uh, looked at this concept of a family housing project and I think helped grow it beyond family housing, so we adopted uh, the pursuit of a community center and child care space into our concept, as well as uh, looked at an urban school as part of a mixed-use building. And we picked a site that was vacant, owned by the city, and began developing a concept um, in preparation for a request for proposals that the city was going to release um, for affordable housing in this neighborhood. And um, here was another identity kind of crisis conflict for me. So coming out of an architecture firm, um, you know, I had worked in design and architecture, and all of a sudden we're hiring an architect. Okay, so where does this put me in the role of designing this building? And I felt real ownership of, over the concept and, uh, and a hesitation to give up um, responsibility um, on the project. Then we hired a development consultant because it's a big, ambitious project, and us as a small nonprofit don't have the capacity to really um, take this on given the other development projects we have. 
So when we brought in Gert England Development, I was like, well, I'm the property, I'm the project manager, and I want to make this thing happen. Um, so where does this put me in the project? But ultimately, what I realized is um, through working on this is it really takes a team to make these kind of things happen. And uh, regardless um, as to your role on the team, if you're passionate about um, making good stuff happen and kind of just try to grow and fill the gaps around a project, um, uh, overcome challenges, uh, get involved in things that you're not used to that other people aren't picking up, I think um, uh, it helps make a more successful project. So ultimately, you know, my role was as a, a project manager um, on this building, working with our whole team and facilitating their good work to make this um, project happen. So another way to think of that is an owner's representative too. Um, and um, it was interesting because all of a sudden uh, people were looking to me as the expert on family housing <coughs> in urban environments. And so I was invited by the Bureau of Planning to get involved with two efforts as a project advisor at the North Pearl District Plan, extension of the Pearl District um, and the plan for the Northern Extension, and a queered housing um, for families design competition. And I would say the former was um, maybe, uh, for me, the most formative uh, uh, role that I played in shaping um, uh, Portland's downtown, where as part of this plan, I introduced a concept for a density bonus to incentivize the development of modest size two and three bedroom apartments. So if developers built those modest size ones because there was only penthouses being built, they would get a bump in height. Um, as well as this concept of a complete community. So where that as part of this plan, the next, the goal was to create a complete community that would accommodate families and their needs, which includes community center, school, and uh, family housing and childcare. And those would be the, the next priority projects um, in the neighborhood. Um, so this was the Bureau, the Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability crafting the vision for the extension of um, the central city in the North Pearl. Um, we mentioned market studies as um, uh, one kind of activity of, of a developer, and this is uh, focus groups. So uh, we had crafted our vision, came up with some concept designs, and invited families and children to comment on them. And I think this was a really important um, opportunity to see if there was a market for this kind of housing. Many people said families don't want to live downtown. Why would they want to be there? And we actually learned through these focus groups that it would have a broad appeal um, with these kinds of uh, units in a high-rise building um, in this neighborhood with all of these amenities. But ultimately, um, there were barriers to making this happen. And, you know, there was other barriers beyond this, but uh, initially there was a delay in releasing that RFP for the piece of property right there in the Pearl. It's just a triangular shape next to the, the train tracks. Um, we were waiting uh, on the school. They were super excited about our concept as we showed them how they could fit into this mixed-use building, um, but were figuring out how to raise funds to make it happen. Um, the uh, Resource Access Center um, became a big priority of then City Commissioner Eric Sten, um, who had previously uh, been an advocate for this project, and so that focused a lot of his time. Um, there was a question about the budget of the urban renewal area and whether there would be funding there. There was, at the time, some schools that were going to suck it from the central city, and so that slowed things down, um, as well as, uh, ultimately, another uh, affordable housing project was funded in lieu of ours on a different site. Um, a developer brought a piece of property to the city, and the city, I think, thought, oh, well, we can just give them the money to build it, and then we can keep this property to do something else with. And so the idea of an RFP fizzled away, and the combination of all those things kind of uh, scuttled and uh, initially slowed down our project. And so this is kind of where my um, work plan got a little bit more diverse, like Jesse's. So um, what do I do? Um, uh, as this project is initially on hold and then isn't moving forward. So we have a 
a group that maintains our buildings. Um, it's our maintenance crew. They're called business enterprises, and they bring in uh, people uh, off the streets and out of our programs and help them with job opportunities. And they're, they were wanting to move into one of our spaces, um, and so I helped them design and then ultimately manage the construction of, of a fit-out for them for office space. Their initial um, um, director wanted his own office to fit his table and big desk. And if he would have had his ways, this large space would have only accommodated four offices, all in enclosed office spaces. There is only a little bit of um, storefront um, light coming into this space. And so this is where I think it was a very unique opportunity to be on the owner's side where I was able to work with um, other people in our organization and kind of rally support around this idea of an open office space. And additionally, um, went up to my executive uh, director and measured his office space and showed how this was going to be an obscene size compared to that. And um, together with um, the help of a uh, employee who worked here, we were able to kind of twist arms and uh, make this open office space happen. And so it, this is an amazing space to see today where um, uh, it accommodates up to 26 people instead of just four. And uh, the community uh, environment that it fosters, I think, is really helpful to this idea of people um, getting introduced to the workplace and um, getting exposure um, to work opportunities. So it's been pretty positive. And then also um, I was able to um, respond to a need among our residential treatment center for um, young women with uh, small kids and uh, either who are pregnant or have just had their kids who are going through recovery. And there's a short residential treatment program to, to initiate their recovery. And we needed housing um, for them after that program. And so I acquired this four unit um, apartment building that was in sad shape, as you can see on the pictures on the left there initially, and then um, uh, worked on uh, the design and managed the construction of this um, rehab of that building. And it's now um, accommodating 16 families a year as they transition um, into more permanent housing. And then um, in regards to funding and sustainability um, and kind of opportunity creation, I think um, one of the really cool opportunities was um, adopting an ambitious sustainability goal in our Pearl Family Development, that high rise for families. Um, early on, and I think this you know, is attributable to the kind of team that we had, so girding Eland Development, um, us working on an um, you know, ambitious new building, having taken strides before in this area, um, we said, well, why don't we adopt the Living Building Challenge for this um, high rise? And it's going to be hard to make it happen because it's going to cost more, but let's start somewhere and then figure that we'll raise the funds to pay for the increment to get to the living building challenge, whatever that is, 20, 40 percent more than a typical building. And so our strategy for that, and I think you know, a lot of the development process calls for strategy on fundraising, on working with partnerships, was to um, uh, reach out to um, a foundation, get early funding for pursuing one aspect of the living building challenge, um, make some successes, and then um, uh, reach out through them to other funders. And so we approached the Bullet Foundation to fund uh, the water side, the water pedal of the Living Building Challenge. This is a diagram of all the possible water paths in a building, if you're thinking about a net zero water building. Um, this You can download this online. It's called Achieving Water Independence in Buildings. And it shows how rainwater and gray water and black water um, can supply fixtures and then be captured and reused from fixtures and, and for what things. Um, so the Bullet Foundation funded this, which was to figure out how to make a water independent building. And if successful in this, we were then going to have Dennis Hayes, the, the president of the Bullet Foundation, help us um, uh, uh, ask money from all of his buddies who had more money. Um, so. What this illustrates here is the barriers um, to reusing water in this way. And so in order to do this, we would have had to submit uh, building code appeals 
for each instance of, of water reuse that we wanted to pursue. So if we wanted to capture rainwater and drink it, that would be one building appeal. If we wanted to capture gray water coming out of a bathtub and use it to flush toilets, that would be another appeal. So you can see that there's these barriers um, which are in boxes um, along each of these pathways. And as we um, pursued this project, we got everybody in one room, kind of like the family forum, you know, get everybody hashing out the idea. And what we learned um, was that people were pretty excited about this. Even the regulatory agencies, um, the DEQ, um, the Bureau of Development Services, all those people that would be involved in um, approving an appeal were actually um, kind of supportive. Initially, when we met with them one-on-one, -on -one, they were pointing to the other agencies as the one who had the problem. But once we got them all together in one room, they actually were like, you know, we could probably do this. And, oh, you don't have a problem with that? Cool. So what we um, ended up realizing through this initial large charrette getting everybody together is that we could have a serious impact beyond a single building and pursue uh, code appeals on a statewide basis. So there's building by building code appeals, which all of you will be involved in when you're um, working on buildings, because not everything meets the code and you want to challenge some things. But for those things that make sense on a statewide basis, you can actually create a kind of alternative pathway to the code that gets adopted by a state jurisdiction and becomes a perfectly acceptable means um, to meet the intent of the code. So what we were able to do here through this process and then ultimately working with the um, plumbing board of the code as well as the statewide agency is to actually um, uh, propose and get accepted alternative pathways. So now there's a pathway to use rainwater for drinking and there's a pathway for gray water reuse in buildings, both on the residential side and the commercial side. So we changed <coughs> statewide code. And I think ultimately we're very successful um, in this project, which is how do we overcome these barriers uh, to make a water independent rural family development? And then ultimately, um, it's funny, these projects never turn out how you expect. So um, all of the work on identifying the needs, um, all of the work in uh, the North Pearl District planning process, all the connections we made, we had families who went to the city councilors and talked about and demanded um, amenities in this neighborhood. Um, and I think all of that came together to um, really make this stuff ultimately happen. And so when I mentioned that other project was funded in the neighborhood, different piece of property. Well, it turns out that um, when PDC awarded them funding from the Urban Renewal District, they said, well, of course, you need to do these other things in this project that the neighborhood is asking for. Um, family size units, two and three bedroom, affordable uh, to those people below 60% uh, area median income, and um, community space, and a school. And so the Portland Public Schools is leasing um, space in the ground floor uh, to provide Head Start programs and a school. And um, uh, the Zimmerman Community Center is operating Isabel's Clubhouse um, out of the ground floor of the Ramona Apartments. And this is in the northern part of the Pearl District, uh, developed not by Central City Concern, but another uh, developer in, in Portland. Um, and then I'll just quickly, um, I think, you know, that, that sums up my fellowship period. Um, and uh, it's been pretty interesting staying on with my organization. I've found that it's been very satisfying and uh, just fulfilling my interest in having maximum impact on the built environment. And I feel like, for me, it's really happened through helping my organization adopt ambitious and even audacious goals. And um, recently, you know, one of our, our ambitious goals have, has grown out of looking at energy usage in our buildings. And so we've been realizing that if you look at um, the income and expenses of our entire portfolio of buildings over time, um, the income from rents and subsidies actually exceeds operating expenses right now. So it actually supports our organization. and 
Uh, it's what investors can refer to as positive cash flow. It's like good money that you can use stuff with. Um, and then going forward into time, because household incomes and rents only increase about 2% per year, but operating expenses are at least 3% and utility costs probably more, there comes a time maybe about 15 years out where our portfolio goes into the red. And for us, you know, this is a big issue of what Jesse mentioned about preservation of affordable housing and the sustainability of our buildings. And um, so we realize that a lot of this is on the utility side um, of things with kind of huge uh, potential escalations. And so um, in the similar way as the Achieving Water Independence Project, we kicked off um, you know, this challenge with a large charrette where we presented our problem to a group of experts, including kind of our partner architects and funders. And we came up with this concept of uh, getting our portfolio to net zero by 2030 and making 20% reductions every five years with an initial 20% reduction in the next couple years and have been doing the kind of due diligence and the work to make that happen over the course of the last year and a half. So our goal is to take 10 buildings to reduce um, our overall portfolio consumption by 20%. What that means is about $300,000 saved in utilities every year. We spend about a million and a half. And so if you think about it, we're paying for all of our tenants' utilities. They are at the lowest income and, and can't pay the utility bill themselves. And so that offers huge opportunity <coughs> if you're able to make those savings and put that money to good use. Um, in this case, um, uh, Rebecca here actually um, volunteered with us recently and is helping um, our team here through a design workshop come up with resource conservation measures. So we've identified several measures that we're going to be implementing in our building uh, buildings. Here's our 100% um, our reduction goal for 2030. Um, it's basically taking kind of a passive house approach, which um, Jesse mentioned that she's pursuing in one of her buildings. We're air sealing the envelope and putting in extreme insulation, including the windows. You're adding heat recovery ventilation to <laughs> capture the waste heat, putting in efficient lights and fixtures, low flow fixtures, and uh, decreasing the usage by about 80% and then tagging on renewables on top of that to get to the net zero. And to date, we've already carried this out in one of our buildings. And so here's a project that I recently managed that uh, managed to get a 37% reduction in energy use by doing some partial insulation measures, um, solar thermal, uh, lighting paired with uh, natural daylight, photo and occupancy control, um, and then really efficient fixtures. And we did things like, this wouldn't be normal in affordable housing, but because of, I think, you know, the interest of the fellowship and designers were like, okay, we're going to make this extremely energy efficient. That's our main goal. And as we looked at windows, um, I was able to get in triple paned fiberglass windows out of Canada um, because of our goals of durability and extreme energy efficiency when the typical one would be vinyl. So again, it's kind of like finding these um, points, I think, where because of our interests can really help um, clearly set some, some, some good goals for an organization. And again, ultimately, this brought a 37% energy reduction for a community of 38 people living with um, HIV and AIDS in this Rosewood Apartments here. And then just as an aside, I'm pretty excited about um, my current um, out of the work project where I'm going to relocate to the east side and my partner Marta and I are building a passive house. And I think I couldn't have done this without some of the experience that the Rose Fellowship gave me about managing budgets, uh, the importance of contracts, um, and working with contractors in the way uh, that an owner does. Um, and then also just the idea about setting ambitious goals and getting people excited about it and, and uh, partnering in a project. And so we're still far from done, but it's a four-story building on a 30 by 40 foot lot. And it has two units, and so the Upper three stories are the main unit. There's an attached accessory dwelling unit in the basement that's a studio. And it's got some crazy things in it. And I'd love for all of you guys to come up and uh, do a tour sometime. Um, we were able to fully air seal the building and get to a 0.45 
um, lower door test rating, as well as uh, use um, insulated wood windows out of Germany that are tilt-turn variety that are really um, excellent in insulation and air sealing. And we have a unique double wall uh, construction that's a two by six structural wall with a two by four curtain wall hung off the outside. It's all FSC lumber, including um, cedar cladding on the outside, which is a rain screen system. And so um, we have a blog um, because again, wanting to make a maximum impact on the built environment. This is one of the first passive houses in the nation. We wanted to share um, what we're doing with other people um, in this building. And if you actually put a forward slash in, in front of Lone Fur and write out wiki, it'll get you to the building plans for the project too. And so you can see how we had to kind of develop a commercial set of drawings to explain the air sealing and the advanced framing um, to the contractor and really assure what we wanted that what we saw is what we got in the building. So, um, any questions? Do you do <coughs> resident education about lowering research levels? Of like, because it seems like that's the other half of it, right? I mean, you're doing these other higher technology things, but is there a part of it that is also user -based. I think so. I think that's huge. Um, what's been a challenge for me is um, with you know um, my role on the capital improvement and building side is how to uh, create that bridge to the side of our organization that works with residents and does education. And so um, Rebecca and I thought about this a lot, and we. Um, uh, realize that you know we'd probably be better off putting our efforts on um, the behavior change side of things than actually all of these improvements in order to really get reductions. And what we learned through some surveying of our tenants is that they're really excited about saving energy and actually are behind our mission and want to help other people. So they can help save money. They realize that that money can help um, other people uh, and preserve the affordable housing and the services. Uh, in our portfolio of buildings. And so um, going forward, our, our plan does call for both these capital improvement measures, but also um, uh, education and kind of behavior change um, measures, which is about getting our resident services staff on board and, um, and rolling out education programs. Showed that got built by someone else in, in the district. Mm -hmm. That happens to be over the same people who did the same cut. It is, yeah. Oh, sorry, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's jump into the next Rose Fellowship opportunities, um, and then we can open it up to questions after that um, related to those particular opportunities. So I'll turn it over to Jesse. And I'll just go through these really quick because all this information is online. Is anybody here interested in applying for a Rose Fellowship? I'm a couple oh, of people. This is how exciting it is, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, if, if, if this isn't something that's interesting to you, by all means, this is a good time to funnel out. But um, there are five opportunities offered this year. I, I really can't recommend this highly enough. I think it's an amazing opportunity. Uh, three years at first seemed like a long time. I was like, oh my gosh, how can I commit? Um, but then it flies by and, you know, in the scheme of professional development, it's nothing and it's a, it's a really good chunk of time to get your feet wet in, in the development world. So there's five opportunities this year. Um, one rural fellowship in Yakima, Washington, also working on farm worker housing. Um, we've got St. Paul, Detroit, Burlington, Vermont, and Boston. Um, all of these have fellowship positions. So I don't know. So I'm just going to do a quick description of the five here based on this information that you can find online. So Nuestra Comunidad Development Corporation, actually we visited this, um, this organization when I was a Rose Fellow because you, you meet up with the other Rose Fellows a couple times a year, which is actually one of the best parts of being part of the fellowship um, because of that kind of peer network. And you know it's fun. You get to know this group of people, but you also I got to visit a ton of cities that I had never had the opportunity to see before, and um, be able to tour 
them, you know, from a development, a community development kind of standpoint. Um, so that was really educational, I think, just learning about how different cities operate. Um, so we, we were able to visit this one. It looks like a really neat opportunity. It says here, Nuestro Comunidad Development Corporation is devoted to building the wealth and enhancing the physical, economic, and social well-being of Roxbury <coughs> and other underserved populations in greater Boston. And they talk about um, the outcomes for, for what they want the fellow to do. Um, one important desired outcome is that the Rose Fellow will gain significant experience in real estate project finance. Um, that's not always kind of spelled out in that way for the fellowship, so that's a, a unique opportunity if you're interested in the kind of development finance side of things, which um, I became very interested in through the course of my fellowship. Um, also, they hope that Nuestra's real estate and community organizing staff will have gained capacity in leading effective community design processes. So they want people who will get out there kind of doing the kind of stuff that Ben was talking about and um, leading community design. And on a local level, the fellows work will educate neighbors in our target area because it will be connected to local community design committees and review bodies for Bartley Yard. So again, another great opportunity to work in the community with other stakeholders. Uh, this is the opportunity in Burlington, Vermont with Cathedral Square Corporation. Uh, it says Cathedral Square Corporation is the state of Vermont's largest provider of senior housing. So it looks like a pretty big organization. I'm sure you'd get the opportunity to work on a diversity of projects there. Um, the kind of expected outcomes they're looking at are to develop in-house capacity to develop green buildings. So they want that kind of expertise. Integrate aging service technologies into new and existing properties demonstrate the not-for-profit difference, um, use CSC as the go-to partner, and obtain resources to meet CSC's full potential, um, among other, uh, demonstrate that CSC is a magnet organization offering a creative, stimulating, and healthy culture. So I think they're looking for kind of a refreshing design for aging in place type of, type of projects. Detroit, this would be exciting. This is with the Detroit Collaborative Design Center. Um, it's a self-sustaining component within the University of Detroit, Mercy, a Catholic university in the Jesuit and Mercy traditions, which exists to provide excellent student-centered undergrad and grad education in an urban context. And they are looking for a few key outcomes of the fellow. They want project design and civic engagement. Um, they want the Rose Fellow to be able to show documents that illustrate the consistent coordination between the project's design and citizen input and feedback, which they will this fellow will solicit. Um, project design and policy. The Rose Fellow will generate a policy scan and action step in coordinating policy reformation with the project's design and intention. So I'm assuming that's an opportunity to work either with the city or with other stakeholders there. Um, also, project design and construction implementation. The Rose Fellow will ensure the project's design integrity as we move through the various consultants and construction process. So if you're looking for a construction admin experience, this might be a good spot for you. St. Paul, Minnesota. Where this one go? This is with the St. Paul Riverfront Corporation. Uh, it's a nonprofit that has been serving the community for more than 25 years, and its mission has recently evolved from a focus on the river to becoming the champion of urban design for the entire city of St. Paul. So, <coughs> sounds exciting. And some of the outcomes they expect are three to six affordable housing developments directly affected by the Rose Fellows' presence. That's a, that's a healthy work plan. I would sign up for that in a heartbeat. <laughs> that's good. Um, improving community opinion about the community benefits of the organization. They want to look for better water quality in the Mississippi River and certainly less impact from the Central Quarter, so they're concerned about environmental issues in their community. Uh, they want a more progressive city approach to green development and public realm best managed practices and an evolving community profile of broader age, cultural, and economic diversity, diversity at each station area. So quite a bit there. And I think the rural this group in Yakima, I've actually met with them a few times. It's a wonderful group. They have a ton of projects, and they're doing uh, really great stuff in eastern Washington. The Office of Rural and Farmworker Housing is a private statewide nonprofit corporation that develops housing for farm workers and other rural low-income res residents in Washington State. And some of the outcomes that they're looking for are to engage at least two communities in structured conversations regarding design and community planning assist in researching demographic and economic data 
to evaluate the need and demand for affordable housing in rural Washington communities, um, assist in determining preliminary feasibility of land construction and ongoing operations of development proposals, actively participate in managing a development through the design, budgeting, bidding, contractor selection, and construction process. So again, if you're looking for CA hours, you know, for IDP credit or otherwise, you might get that here. Um, and following issuance of certifications of occupancy for completed developments, work with the owner and property manager on issues related to residents moving into the development. Um, so it looks like life cycle occupancy type stuff. So that's another important thing um, to note about the opportunity of the fellowship is it's highly supportive of people who are looking for licensure and um, ways to fulfill their IDP credits. Even though it, it gets a little tricky because you're not working for an architecture firm, several of us have had that issue. Um, but they will set you up with an architect mentor for the course of your fellowship. And so even though you may have to navigate that a little with the IDP process, um, there will be someone there who can sign off on your hours. So if that's part of your professional goals, that's something that will be supported. And yeah, that's all. We can open it up to questions or if anyone kind of wants to talk more one-on-one -on -one out of the reception, Ben and I will hang out for a while and we're happy to answer any questions.